It is said that Hawaii's economy depends on small businesses. Statistics show that a little more than half of Hawaii's workforce is employed by small business owners. But the state gets low marks as a place to do business because of regulations, taxes, and startup costs. What does it take to start a small business in Hawaii? What resources are available for young entrepreneurs? Join us for a conversation about business startups. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Laura Yamada. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics says about 20% of all startup businesses typically don't survive past year one of operation and nearly half never make it to their fifth anniversary. Location is often cited as the most common reason for startup failures. In Hawaii, other factors often cited higher costs for just about everything and not understanding the process. With us tonight are experts who offer different perspectives about starting up and owning a business in Hawaii. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. All right, now to our guests. Joseph Burns is the Oahu Director of the Hawaii Small Business Development Center, a position he has held for 10 years. And Donovan Koki is the Senior Vice President at Bank of Hawaii. He has 36 years of credit and lending experience in Hawaii and also in California. Holly Harding is the uh, founder of O'o Hawaii, a small business that specializes in skin care products. She has been a successful small business owner for more than 13 years now. And Colleen McAlooney is the program director of the Patsy Mink Center for Business and Leadership. Previously, she worked for 15 years as a buyer, a merchandiser for Renz. So thank you so much, all of you, for being here. I know this is a topic of such interest to so many people because we have passionate, creative people here who um, have wonderful ideas and, and want to start a business, but there are an awful lot of realities to deal with as well. So, so let's talk about uh, this reputation that Hawaii has as the, the worst state in the nation to do business. Maybe I'll start with you, uh, Joseph. Is that, is that fair to say that? Is it? Well, I would say we do have some challenges that other places don't have. In other words, <laughs> structural challenges. Being in the middle of the ocean obviously is a challenge. A small population is another challenge. So we do definitely have challenges that other places do not have. However, in our line of work, we see that that's not necessarily something that means that you're going to fail. There are ways to be successful. There are things that you can do. We have a lot of good successful businesses here. Holly has her, on her second business now. We've been able to work with her a little bit to help out. So even though there are some of those things, there are ways to be able to get around them and become successful. So maybe not quite fair. Not quite fair to say it's the worst. Well, I don't think it goes <laughs> deep enough. Yeah. In other words, the analysis is not deep enough to really understand why we might have those challenges and what we can do about them. So if you just look on a surface level, yeah, we're, we're terrible. It's difficult. But the understanding is really not there in some of these surveys and some of these uh, information that comes out like that. I would imagine that's pretty important, too, if we want to think about what it, we, we need to do um, and what we can do as a business community to create a, a continuous fabric throughout this community that's going to uh, make sure that there are those gaps in, in support. Mm -hmm. for, for businesses. So you, you work with you work with women and with the center there? Quite I do yeah. at the Patsy Teaming Center for Business yeah. and Leadership. We're a women's business center and of one of over a hundred across the country and it's I think it's challenging no matter where you are to start a small business. It's it's challenging to be an entrepreneur no matter where you are. Uh, it's we like to support women. We help men also at our center, but we help women at the very basic level. They come to us to talk about their ideas, basically. Most of the people who come to our center don't have a business yet. They just have an idea. They've been thinking about it. We find the trend right now, a lot of women are on their second, kind of second career or looking at uh, something that they've thought about for a long time and now they're ready to transition towards that maybe. Uh, they've had a, a full, full-time career and now they're excited about something. But uh, it's just basics and what they need to do to get started. So there's some things that 
um, right at the bat that you know um, need to be asked mm -hmm. uh, because everybody's situation is different. Everybody has a different background and some people maybe had more time to be able to kind of think about um, a strategy in some shape or form. Right. What are some of the core things that right off the bat you need, know you need to address to see if this person is, is starting on the right track and has the ability to do it? Right. Well, for us, it's what's your idea? Is your concept unique enough? Is there a need or a desire for it in the market? And are you going to is it going to fulfill a purpose or is it a viable is it a viable idea or what can we do to help you make it a viable idea i know that um I know that Joe Center also SBDC helps with the same thing, but it's 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 definitely making sure that we're helping to set them up for success, and so it's it's just honing down, working with the, on the business model canvas, helping them with a marketing plan, a business plan, and of course for our clients, it's where are they going to get funding? How are they going to get funding? So that leads right to you, Donovan. <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking too about some of the realities mm -hmm. that people need to think about what you're thinking about sure, certainly. when they're coming in. Certainly. And um, uh, those are fantastic topics. And I'm actually glad for the resources that uh, these uh, two um, folks bring to the table, if you will, because they actually help a lot of these new startups to kind of, if you will, get a reality check. Mm -hmm. They've been in the system for such a long time. They know to a great extent what the banks um, are looking for. Um, banks are in there for the most part. If you look at the return that banks get for lending money, mm -hmm. it's pretty low. And yet the owners themselves, if they do a really good job, their return is sky's the limit. Whether I get 13, 15, 20, 30, 50, 1,000 percent, that all goes to the owners. But the bank can only earn a return that's X number of dollars. So we are real clear is that we are also stewards of the people's money. As a banking institution, is our job is also not only is certainly is to help support the community across the board, but is also to bring some safety and some certainty to the customers who are depositing those funds because they themselves uh, individually cannot help to fund small businesses by themselves. So what they do is they use banks as a collective. I mean, if you look at it from that perspective, is a way to pull money together and bring it out there. And then they get a return on their capital that they're depositing in the banks through the form of their savings deposits. Of course, rates have not been yeah. as... Um, so, so what are you looking for? Mm -hmm. And what are some of the kind of obvious red flags? Like right off the bat, mm -hmm. for the average person coming in, um, that kind of clue you in as to whether or not they're prepared or you need to have a discussion with them? Uh, is where their focus is. Mm -hmm. So a couple things that I'm looking for, for the most part, um, your business. What has your track record been like in the past? Um, is this something that you've been doing beforehand that you've been able to execute? I'm, I mean, ideas are great, but I'm pretty certain around this table, many of us have tremendous amount of ideas over our 30, 40, your careers, if you will, three of us are not entrepreneurs, I would think. I think you're quite successful at that. Um, but um, I, I th one is, I think these individuals are unique. But I've had probably, I've been a serial entrepreneur earlier in my years, and I've had great ideas. But the question is, can I execute? And do I have a track record of executing in that particular space? Execution is everything. Ideas or potential or human potential is sky's the limit. But the ones who succeed are the ones who can demonstrate ability to execute on a plan and make this thing happen. You made a good point when we were talking earlier about how it's one thing that somebody can talk about an idea mm -hmm. as opposed to something that truly is, um, you know, true to what they want to do and true to what they believe in as opposed to what sounds good to get the loan. Yes, <laughs> yes. And we do, so um, I've read a number of business plans and so forth. And sometimes the business plans don't come in a written format. Some of these business plans are in my discussions with these individuals. Tell me a little bit about what you do. Tell me a, bit, a little bit about your background. Um, and then I get a feel for what are some of the strategies that they're employing, certainly the industry that they're in, what are the conditions that exist in that industry. Uh, I do gauge them from the perspective of what we call the five C's of credit, and probably most of you have heard that acronym, right? It is about character, it's about capacity, it's about collateral, it's about uh, capital, and it's about um, 
gosh, the last uh, conditions that exist. So conditions meaning what's happening on the ground? What does the industry or the economy look like? Is this the kind of, so if I'm selling a particular good that doesn't really do that well in a downward economy, geez, is this is really the good time to put any financing under there, right? Because once you put financing under there, you now have a fixed obligation that you gotta make that payment every month. And that is, so the question is, can you make it through that? And do, have you demonstrated that? Um, or shown the, the ability to demonstrate re, um, generating recurring cash flows? Because if all you're doing is now focusing about how I'm gonna make that next bill payment, as opposed to focusing on what you should be doing, which is building your business and running that business, You've got, I think, um, to a great extent, you're in for a really rough ride. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the reality of, our, of a lot of these markets, isn't it? Because um, I would imagine there are quite a few people who uh, start businesses and they haven't thought that far along. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they just whether it be the time or the resources they have or the support that they have, mm -hmm. uh, exposure that they have to be able to, be able to get through that thought process. Uh, you, you've been through more than one business. You've, you've learned a lot through mm -hmm. different types of stages of your experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I find that you have to have long-term strategies and then micro-strategies well, as well. Well, let's talk about first. Would mm -hmm. you tell us about your, uh, your first business and mm -hmm. kind of what that was like. Sure. Um, well, actually, my very, very first business was when I was uh, 21. I had a music entertainment agency wow. back in Boston <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> right after college. So I would book out musicians for different concerts and, and events and different things like that, and myself because I was a musician as well. Uh, so that was my, my first business. Um, but once I moved to Hawaii, I uh, started a company called Bubble Shack Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Is a bath and body and candle company, and um, we uh, ran that company, my husband and I, for over 10 years. And we started it with about $20 and grew it to um, multi-million dollars. And um, we ended up selling it in 2016. So uh, we were uh, focused on more the the sort of mass market. Um, although we had a natural spin to our products, we were kind of niche within the mass market. But we sold all the ABC stores. Um, Target, Walmart, even Whole Foods. Um, so we had that sort of area of the market cornered. Um, but yeah, it was great. It was a it was a the school of hard knocks for sure. <laughs> um, we definitely um, we learned a lot of lessons along the way in that business, and so it kind of set us up uh, in a great position to start our next business, which is um, what I'm doing now, which is OO Hawaii, and it's an upscale skincare line. So it actually focuses on a different demographic this time around. It's um, more um, upscale, so we're focusing on retailers like Neiman Marcus and the Four Seasons and um, some different uh, retailers like that. So what were some of the big lessons mm -hmm. that you learned? Early oh, on, gosh. that you said, "What?" There's so many. <laughs> Where do I start? <laughs> um, let's see. Well, um, you know, that business we actually started kind of like a lot of people I would imagine in Hawaii start their first business, um, kind of tactically versus strategically. Um, you know, we were kind of in a position where we were young, we both had corporate jobs. I worked in corporate marketing, my husband worked in corporate advertising, and you know, we were just, we had bought a house, we were just making ends meet, and so we said, gosh, we've got to figure out something to bring in extra cash so that we're not just paying the bills. And so, oops, just pulled my microphone off. Put that back on. <laughs> hey, you can't take that I off. I talk with my hands. Um, and so, really, I think we, in that business, we really just started with, you know, a, a few bucks and went out and started that whole sort of craft fair market kind of scene and then realized, okay, we need to, like, take a step back and become more strategic. And that's when we put together a business plan. But we were already kind of so deep in the weeds of what we were doing mm -hmm. that it was kind of like, you know, we just had to, like, tactically at that point, like figure out how to move forward. So um, I think really starting off with a really solid strategy in the beginning of who your, who your client base is, you know, the demographics that you're targeting, what stores you want to go after, where you want your brand to follow and settle um, is really important. It's really um, thinking about that brand. Yes. Oh, yeah. very, does that make sense? Very much to your point. point. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah. She's classic mm -hmm. entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, most entrepreneurs do not have a plan when they start their business. Mm -hmm. they just, they're just so excited mm -hmm. about That's what they they have and mm -hmm. like you said they're trying to make ends meet and get a little more income that they just get started and just go mm -hmm. without any type of uh, they're educating themselves usually the right mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. not getting any type of structured you know mm -hmm. uh, 
opinion or help with, okay, you should do it this way, this way, this way, which is what you know we try to do at our centers, but usually they're, they've already gone real deep before they get to us a lot of times. This is, this is what you do. This is who you work with oftentimes. Often they've made some successes. We do, and yeah. so I think what Colleen had mentioned just a moment ago about the business model canvas where you can actually see what your business model looks like on a piece of paper is a big help towards getting people focused on the right areas because it talks about things like the resources that you need, who are your partners, your market segmentation, of course finance which is always a big area. So if we can get people sort of back down to earth with their feet on the ground by using a tool like that, it's extremely helpful. We have people that come to us with 17 different ideas that are floating around and they want to do all of them at once, which is obviously a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. So start on the best one first. What's the best one? Well, if you can map it out, take a look, understand your market segmentation, understand your financing, uh, understand you know, how this is going to work, and then lead into a plan, lead into a, you know, some preparation so that you're not undercapitalized and you know who you're selling to, you know how to produce your product, you have a much better chance of success than if you're just sort of shooting from the hip. Yeah. I, and this, yeah, go ahead. And it was actually fascinating is uh, one of the things if I were looking at her business plan is her company is a marketing company mm -hmm. and her background was in marketing. Right, so she had a track record in that particular space, and now you know, getting a business off the ground, she's probably put in a lot of sweat equity going in there before even getting any bank financing mm -hmm. to make sure this is something that's going to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, banks are really good at providing expansionary capital for companies that look like that they're running that trajectory. So they're in that instead of that early startup stage uh, growth phase, which, mm -hmm. like uh, earlier in the segment said most businesses will fail within, or 50% of business, I think was the number, uh, within their first year, they're gone. Mm -hmm. right? So this pure, mere having gotten past that stage and showing some track record and looking at your skill sets that made that happen, your marketing company, it's not a, it wasn't her product, mm -hmm. it was their marketing expertise, mm -hmm. I think was very crucial in their success and getting up to the point where in 2016, you got to sell it for a nice chunk of change. Yeah. I think. Um Creating a, a viable brand is so unbelievably important, especially in this market where you have so many different just products and, and things that people are trying to create and sell and sell and sell and sell. And it's like if you're just kind of trapped within this like local souvenir product, because that's predominantly what mm -hmm. most people are trying to do here, um, you, you get a little lost. So you have to really work to create that brand that's going to really soar above and, and really create something unique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if you, uh, if we take a step back just a little bit here, we get to Sandra from Kona's question where she says, she wants you to kind of start from the beginning here, like just spelling out the steps for starting a business. Got to get the GET license first. What are, the, what are the things right off the bat that you, or I guess, it's, I guess it depends how you would approach this question, isn't it? Yes. Well, okay. I mean, you can get a GET license, but I think before you even think about doing that, you want to do some preparation. You want to model your business on the business model canvas. You want to maybe do a business plan to do some planning, to see what kind of things you're going to need, to decide who your customers are, what kind of product you're selling, uh, all the things that you find out in a business plan. How are you going to manage things? So before you go out and register your LLC, I mean, there are these kinds of steps that are preparatory that you need absolutely to do. And we find that there are studies that show that the businesses that prepare not surprisingly, are the ones that survive mm -hmm. the longest and the, the most successful. So that's what we always counsel people to do is do some preparation. Right. Colleen, you need to educate our center, yourself. we can yeah. help them with that. So oh, go right. ahead. There's a great plan that you can actually um, use online. It's you were just going to answer my question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. You read yeah. my mind. It's called Live Plan. Live, yes. L-I-V-E. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Live it's, plan. it's a great tool. Uh, to really help walk you through the steps, because Sandra, if you're live plan, yeah, live, live plan. Because if you're just told, hey, put together a business plan, what is that? What is you know, how do I do that? It actually literally has a template and walks you through every step, and it actually makes you think more in depthly about what you're doing. It's fantastic. It's we utilize it at our center, and also Dream Builders is another one. Dream that's, Builders, that's fantastic. I think is that the one that 
Mm -hmm. This is like also free. This is a free service. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a free service, or do you have to pay a little bit? You, have to you pay. might have to pay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You do. Okay. But what's Small nice about it is yeah. anyone that you might be working with as a resource partner can have access online. Oh wow! So it's not emailing back and forth plans mm -hmm. and who has the latest version and no, I didn't see my That's changes. Great. Mm -hmm. So kind of like a Google form type of yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly yeah. It's, it's, shared drive. Yeah. It's great for husband and wives. <laughs> they got to store constantly. That's good. Yeah. So then, so then when you when you I think. I think a lot of this is probably psychological for people too, mm -hmm. that it just feels so daunting mm -hmm. to sit down and create a strategy, create a business plan. If you haven't done it before, um, I think that the, the entirety of it mm -hmm. is, 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 feels daunting to people. It's extremely overwhelming. Mm -hmm. can be, but at the same time, if you're really passionate and excited about something that you're about to create, it's actually really fun. And mm -hmm. it's pretty invigorating. I mean, I think, yeah, you can feel overwhelmed at times, but yeah, if the passion's behind it, you're like anxious to just figure out every aspect of how you're gonna do it and how you're gonna make it work. I love that. Mm -hmm. It's about passion. And, and I think yeah. that's where the SBDC, the Women's Business Center comes in, is you hit a roadblock in your planning, you call up or you email, and you get to talk to somebody about how to get through that. That's what we're here for. So right. it may be daunting when you look at the whole thing, but if you take it step by step, you can get through it. You're talking about patience. <laughs> patience, <laughs> I guess, yeah. Wow. Patience. Well, that's the thing. If you're extremely passionate, you just want to go, go, go and get it done, right? So sometimes that's, that's what Joe's talking about. You need to pull back a little bit and say, okay, no. You, you know, you really do need to, to uh, go out there and test market your product a little bit. Take the time. Don't rush it. Or you need to tweak a little bit. Or, you know, it's constant. There's constant change and constant updating. And so trying to have a client be patient, like you said, it, that, that can be another challenge for us too. So let's think about uh, this market here. Um, and, and I'm sure some of the, the di challenges obviously would you'd find elsewhere as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the, the conversations that you always have uh, about things that maybe people don't necessarily think of as being one of the bigger uh, hurdles uh, when they have their own business. We were talking before about um, being aware of um, the labor situation mm -hmm. and what you need to think of and who you're trying to hiring and at what cost and what does that mean then. Um, talk about that a little bit more about some of the uh, some of the um, particular areas that, that you need to have a little bit more in-depth discussions or they need to have amongst their support group to understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. Well, what we see as a pattern Laura, quite a bit is that companies don't know how much money they actually need. Mm -hmm. So they'll go to the bank and say, I need to borrow money. And the bank says, how much? And they say, as much as possible. That's the wrong answer. You have to say completely uh, clearly what it is you need and what you're going to use it for. Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of companies that go in and start out that are undercapitalized. They don't have enough money. And that's a sure path to failure, not having enough money. So how do you figure out how much money you need? Well, guess what? That's part of the business plan. There's a financial element in the business plan that addresses that question about who your customers, what are your products, where your se where's your segmentation, what are you selling? Those kinds of things can be estimated and put into a plan so that when you go to see the bank, mm -hmm. you can say, yes, I need $150,000 and this is what it's going to be used for. And not only that, this is how I'm going to pay you back. So all that comes from the business plan. And then you always add 25 to 30% more than what you think. <laughs> as well as two months' time for the bank to make up their mind. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. no, no. Okay. Hey, we're talking reality. Maybe, maybe, maybe. It, it kind of depends, I think. It does. Because if they don't get you all the information, you can't make it. Absolutely. And it's really about getting all the information. Yeah. Um, and um, th that is actually the responsibility, really, of, of the owner. Right. Um, we can give you a, a laundry list of items and so forth. You got to be diligent in providing for that. And once that laundry list comes in, they all come at once. You'll have a bank officer start looking this over. One is the things that we're going to do is we're going to look at connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. And if the dots are not connecting, so kind kind of going back to that, one of the challenges is about labor. Okay, well I'm going to hit a twenty million dollar revenue target by X number of years and so forth. This is year one, year two, year three, year four. And it's also very useful, at least in a 12-month forecast, 
in the initial stages, and you'll keep running those forecasts as you are going on down the road. But in those initial statements, that 12-month forecast is helpful because that's where you're going to see the sort of that nitty-gritty. How is this? How are these funds being deployed? What are you going after? Where are some of your soft spots going to be? Because if there's no cash flow being generated, how are you going to pay back the debt? The other thing we're going to look at is is so how much does it really take to produce this and what is your evidence or if you will what is the rationale and does that really foot up banks also have access to a uh, what we call a peer benchmarking so benchmarking studies are extremely helpful in trying to if so if you're building a business plan and looking at the finance portion Getting a benchmarking study for people who are already in that business is a great way to start from that very early stage. Um, how do I build my plan? And then we're going to look at what is the industry doing? And I'll kind of, uh, so if have, you haven't heard, uh, I use a Michael Porter business model, right? Kind of five force analysis, what's going to occur? What is your competition? What is really the market or industry look like? And who are these competitors, right? Suppliers are competitors, buyers are competitors. People who want to come into the market's a competitor. The guys who are providing substitute products you are competitors. You have to understand too. You yeah. have to understand the landscape. Absolutely. And, and the, the behaviors that are happening in that landscape. Absolutely. Not and if you start shifting your behavior, what yeah. does everybody else do in that circle? Right. 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 Because they don't function in a very static environment. These guys are super dynamic Variables. Well. That's hard for people mm -hmm. yeah. to understand and to to continue to manage variables. Mm -hmm. And that kind of leads to one of the questions uh, here, and I wish I had him on the phone because I feel like I need uh, more, more details, Martin. He said, I tried to start a business on the Big Island after starting four successful businesses on the mainland. And he said, I had capital and everything in place, but bureaucracy stopped me here in Hawaii. <clears throat> um, and, I, and I can't tell you specifically what kind of bureaucracy, but in the, 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 the theme of that, What's your, what's your response to, to what's happening here in Hawaii and how much um, government bureaucracy, or other types of red tape um, people either aren't aware of or are truly a challenge because of how they're changing? Just how, how much you just respond to that? Well, I'd like to know more about his <laughs> right, more experience right. as well. <laughs> Send I'm, us a follow-up letter or a, a, yeah, a question I'm, after this. <laughs> I'm guessing it might be something like a construction business, which is you know certainly yeah. regulated. And when you're dealing with uh, you know building permits yeah. and those kinds of things, uh, so it really does surprisingly lengthy experience uh, yes. time, uh, of time. Exactly. Um, and if you you done business on the mainland, mm -hmm. your expectation would be different. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Right. Exactly. And that's, it yeah. depends on what kind of bureaucracy he's talking about. Yeah. It could be that. He's he might be in a mall and it's a build out just like Joe's saying, but a lot of times we find some small businesses they get so excited that they're being offered this what they think is a fantastic lease yeah. in a location okay. that we would definitely say, oh my gosh, don't you dare sign that <laughs> lease. You've got it. You're you're crazy. Don't sign a ten year lease. So it, it just depends on a what lot of time before right. It it's like mm -hmm. what are you right. thinking? Which a lot of oh my gosh, here in what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on right what he, what he's thinking about because. But I think in general, that sense that our bureaucracy is very heavy mm -hmm. has a very hand on, on biz, a very heavy hand on business is true. And companies do run into issues with the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. it's Explain just, that a little bit more. What do you well, mean by that? So I had a client that uh, was putting up a used car lot. He actually happened to be uh, in construction, but he also uh, wanted to put up. And it took him a really long time just to get a very basic permit to use the parking lot for his cars. Mm -hmm. And meantime, he's paying rent on the property. So that's just one example, and there's lots of examples like that, where we hear that the county or the city is improving the application process, let's say, for construction, and yet things still take a long time. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the reality, perhaps, that the, the question asker is, is referring to, and maybe it's in another area, but it's definitely a reality here, right. and I think that um, it just has to be dealt with. I mean, you have to understand the reality of it and then take what we have and do your best with it. How do you have that discussion with, um, say, these types of, of variables or challenges that, um, you know, they might have a different experience elsewhere or it doesn't follow maybe um, a particular logic as to why the process is taking that long? How do you then have that conversation? 
Right. Well, we have we've run into the same the same issue specifically where they are the client has already leased a piece of. They of, really did have that business plan. They yeah, are they've they have the gotten there. They've gotten the funding, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And it it's, I mean, unfortunately, we keep going back to the specific about the build outs because that. There's and always something I'm, with those. Holly must own. have some kind of experience with that too. It's just, it's it's just very onerous. If you can't, you have to lease something, before you can do your remodel or build out or whatever you want to do to change your, to to get your business going or to get your store going if you're brick and mortar, and so. You're stuck. They're stuck. And then maybe that really is going back to the. The reality of padding 20 to 30 percent on top of what you think your cost will be mm -hmm. for the sake of making sure you have the um, additional resources. As well necessary. as the time factor. And yep. mm -hmm. yeah. Which can, yeah. 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 yeah, it goes back to, it's reminding me of the story of the, um, um, I think it was Via Gelato, uh, one of the business owners here mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. had the extremely successful business in an uh, ice cream shop in Kaimuki, mm -hmm. which I pass by with a long line outside all the time. And she opened up the shop in um, Kakaako, yes. and yeah. just as successful as she was, the mm -hmm. cost of the the lease. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes just things like signs, getting a sign up at your business because of things that it gets stuck through with permitting, can be a real hindrance. I mean, we opened a store in Haleiwa at the end of our stint with Bubble Shack, and because the particular building we went into was originally residential, and they were trying to turn it into business, um, you know, it was, it had changed basically the way it was um, permitted. Or, we, yeah. we couldn't get a sign put up. <laughs> and so we were six months into our business and we were putting banners out and every day the department of, <laughs> you know, planning. planning and permitting would come by and give us a slap a on the wrist, a citation and tell us to take our banner down and we're like, how are we supposed to do business here? So we had to get creative, of course. And would you, you know, send a guy out there with yeah, a Yeah, we would stand out in front like of the this. store and blow bubbles wow. and like do all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you, I mean, how do you uh, prepare for that? Or how do you get that information? I, sometimes it's really not as, it's not in a clear process, or there isn't a particular department. Sometimes it's spread within different departments. Mm -hmm. um, what's sort of the, how, what, how do you talk to people about being able to get that level of information to prevent those types of more unpredictable type um, issues that can really hinder business? Mm -hmm. What helps? Just have extra cash, extra. That's where the twenty-five to thirty percent comes in. Is sometimes. Was there any way in hindsight for you <laughs> mm -hmm. to know that that might mm -hmm. happen? In hindsight, I mean, honestly, because it was a new project. Um, it's a lot to think. No, about. I don't. I don't think there was any real. Was there a business owners association that mm -hmm. might have been located in that business community? Mm -hmm. You know where they, um, or uh, you know there are. Uh, I am aware. Throughout in Honolulu, there mm -hmm. are these business associations. Mm -hmm. Curious if they would have been a tremendous resource about what are some of the challenges mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. uh, had dealt with early on in the spaces. By the way, these are some of the things I'm mm -hmm. thinking about. And it's not just about networking or socializing, but really about finding out how do I do business successfully here. Sure. Um, Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Yeah. Chamber I think that's one way I joined them really quick. <laughs> I would think some of the business associations, there'd be varying levels mm -hmm. of engagement. So mm -hmm. what's your, what's your, um, perspective on sort of the landscape of, of different types of associations that are part of this, um, or meant to be part of the support system well, for businesses. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the chamber, Holly, and I know that the, this is the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii um, here in Honolulu, mm -hmm. does a really great job of lobbying the legislature to educate them about some of the bills that they're thinking about, mm -hmm. about how they might be harmful to business. Earlier we were talking about minimum wage as one mm -hmm. of them. Um, and so in years past what they do is just, they were just reactive to some of the bills, but um, recently they've taken a more of an aggressive approach where they actually have bills that they want to put through. So I think the chamber has done a great job in presenting the voice of, of business to the legislature. And that's a big piece of the uh, pie that we're talking about here in terms of you know, improving uh, the processes and making it easier to be able to start the business and carry on the business. So they're really a good resource for, for that as, as one piece. Uh, quick comment by, uh, by David in Hawaii Island. I uh, uh, want to point out that funding for small businesses is also available from credit unions. 
or um, get your take on this one, GoFundMe accounts. Uh, the banks require collateral and are not the only option. What's your thought on GoFundMe accounts? Um, that's a pretty hot debate. Uh, yeah, for yeah. business. Yeah, <laughs> that's a hot debate these days. Um, I think that there, uh, I, I think this is a very fascinating time in terms of the way capital is being um, raised. It's certainly the banks are, don't have the cornerstone under that. I think banks do, uh, and credit unions also are very um, good competitors out there. And I think they're good for the community as well. And uh, they bring sources of capital, some levels of expertise, if you will, to the business communities and so forth. So they're alternative funding sources. The GoFundMe one is pretty interesting, pretty new. I'm st myself, I'm still kind of getting up to speed on how that works all together. Uh, there's also a lot of the online lending platforms that are outside of the state, such as the Cabbage and uh, likewise. And those guys are actually associated with other what banks. What is Cabbage? Cabbage is an online lending platform. So w what it is is really about technological platforms where you actually do your uh, application online and all that good stuff. They it's use more and more. That's what people want to do. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, they're all general. A lot of them are actually associated with other banks. So some of that paper is actually being put out to other institutions and so forth. So you don't. You may not have a local bank in there. It might be another bank. Uh, uh, but interesting, their dollar limits are very large. I mean, I think uh, Cabbage goes up to half a million bucks for a small business. Uh, American Express is another particular space that is in, has entered in, has been in actually in the small business lending segment for quite some time, um, really on an online lending platform perspective. Mm -hmm. That being said, is that is it's not only about lending; it's about the whole kit and caboodle. How do I manage my cash? How do I get all these other um, products and services that will help me to be successful because it's not only about how do I borrow money? What do I do when I start generating cash? Where do I put it? How do I deploy it? How do I make more money out of the money that's coming in here and so forth? I think it's the other part of the equation. Sometimes we tend to forget and I think banks are most, especially your local banks, are uh, to me, of course, I'm biased, um, <laughs> but are best equipped to help uh, support those business owners in terms of managing the whole financial aspect of a business, if you will. Credit unions are also in that particular space, so um, also very good sources of capital. I was just going to comment that uh, I think uh, David is right. There are a lot of sources of capital, mm -hmm. and it really has to be matched to the type of business that you have. So some businesses could do pretty well with the GoFundMe accounts mm -hmm. or, or that kind of online uh, crowdfunding. Yep. Crowdfunding, that's what I was Crowd thinking, funding. like Kickstarter. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. Others. Right, I, was, I was giving a pitch there, I shouldn't have. <laughs> Sorry, uh, branding, <laughs> right. Sorry, generic term. <laughs> but some other, other businesses, it wouldn't work out. So depending on the type of business, that opens up different channels for you. Let's say uh, you're doing farming and you want to get a loan to start your, your farming uh, business. There's obviously a, a different platforms. Uh, mm -hmm. Banks obviously is one, but actually the state of Hawaii has a loan program for, for farmers. Mm -hmm. There's USDA. So depending on what kind of business you have, that will perhaps direct you towards different sources of, of funds. So I think that's a good point. Yep. Definitely. Your we thoughts? actually have a class coming up on crowdfunding in August. Oh, really? Yes. I was just about to ask you your perspective on uh, using crowdfunding. Yes. Well, it's, that, it's an alternative that I think is viable and people should be looking at, for sure. Yeah, we're actually mm -hmm. ex exploring it right now. I think it's a, a good thing when you have a project. Like, mm. for instance, like an existing business that wants to come out with a new product. As opposed to being like the thing you rely yeah, on. Yeah, just like, help me start my business. Yeah. It's not going to really work that way. Right. It's more like, I have this specific project that I'm starting and this is the reason why I'm starting it and this is why this is why it's going to be unique and this is what it's going to bring to the world and then that's when you kind of get more people interested from a crowdfunding standpoint. That's a good point. Um, so here's a question. Um, so some of the numbers start, uh, shared at the start of the show um, that 20 percent or so don't make it first anniversary. Sounds like this applies to storefront or brick and mortar. Is there any data on online businesses? That's the, definitely a shift these days, you know, especially as everybody's going global with their products. Mm -hmm. How do you then sort of assess that? Is it tougher? I haven't heard any numbers about that because it's so difficult to measure. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I don't know. Yeah. 
I mean, I think some of the expenses are still there, whether it's online or whether it's brick and mortar. I mean, for instance, if you have a clothing company, mm -hmm. you still have to do all the design work. You still have to go and get your manufacturing done. You still have to buy inventory. So you still have all of that material that you've invested cash in, and it's an online business. So you still, you know, you still have to bring in the dollars, right, in order to, to recoup your investment. Right. So, I mean, whether that's a physical storefront or it's an online platform, you're going to have to spend money in, in Facebook advertising or digital ads. Um, I, I think it's really becoming one and the same almost. Well, one thing that I, I was going to mention too in that regard, if you're, especially if you're going uh, global, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people probably don't, and this is, I'm sure you deal with this a lot, don't, don't think about the different types of taxes and tariffs that you are dealing with <laughs> oh, when you're yeah. dealing with a different yes. country, which can right. really be a big deal. And depending on what your type of product is, mm -hmm. um, how long is it going to be sitting on that dock? Right. Mm -hmm. Is is it perishable? Is it something that do you know how it's being handled? What is the transportation system? Mm -hmm. I'm sure that that's not always factored into um, what people are thinking about. Right. Well, that's where programs like High Step. <laughs> That's Sorry, it bugs right on my nose. <laughs> it's about to go in my mouth. It's right here. I can see it. I, anyway, so don't mind me if I swat at the air in random ways. It's a friendly bug. Carry on. Just talking about exporting, though, I think that's where programs like uh, the state export promotion program mm. that we were talking about earlier that the federal government supports through the SBA to the state of Hawaii can help companies plan their exporting so that they don't end up with products sitting on the I've dock. I've heard horror stories. Rotting. Right, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And uh, I think Holly's had some experience with uh, the High Step program mm -hmm. uh, that's been really very successful last five or six years in helping companies to get their products at a point where they can be consumed or used in, in, in foreign markets. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the good programs that we have. All right, so here's a question from Tony and Kapolei. Everyone talking about uh, product-based businesses, what about service-based businesses? I think we at one point talked a little bit about um, labor and having to think about that. But when you, when you start to think about um, services mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to products, the marketing for the products, um, what are the things that, that's really important for people to understand that maybe they, they're not factoring um, early on? I do both. I have yeah. my, my health coaching business and then I have my, my skincare line. So the thing with um, both businesses that, is that you're, you're constantly hustling, but at least with a product-based business, I find that once you're kind of in and you have your accounts, at least you have that sort of regular sale, you have that regular cash flow that's coming in versus a service business, you're always constantly hustling. So the difference is that you always have to go out finding new clients, finding new clients, finding new clients to keep the business going versus you still have to find new clients you know, when you're selling a product, but there's a little bit more of just like a rotating wheel that happens. So there's challenges to both. Your overhead cost is usually a little higher when you have a product-based business versus a service-based business, but the hustling factor you know, after the first initial few years is still, I think, a little greater on the service side. What are your thoughts? Other yeah, I, I think that's very true. It just when you have a product and it's physical and you can see it, it just seems like it's a little easier to to sell. So with the service, uh, you just have you have to really have a hook. You have to have some type of, uh, like you said, you have to build your brand. Your you have to market it more. It's you you do it the same way basically. It's it it's. It is the same way, yeah. but it's, no it's right. It, you handle it in the same way, the way that you so, do. And yeah. again, we are a service-based economy. If you, you think about, all, we don't. We actually do more services than I think we do products. Mm -hmm. um, here's a here's a traditional. Your auto mechanic, is service or product? It's a service-based business. Mm -hmm. Yet those guys, it's not so much about the hustling. It's it's that early stage. You will be. But once that branding or that word of mouth about the quality of their work and the way they deliver stuff uh, and so forth, it just sort of almost like a subscription-based business. Mm -hmm. So I dig su subscription-based businesses, if you will, to a great extent. There are services. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if you even think about health clubs. Mm -hmm. Health clubs are subscription-based businesses. It's not that they're going out there hustling. They've got a product that somebody wants. It's You can't touch it. You can't. But I can walk in and get all this stuff done, but I don't walk out with a physical product. The physical product is me walking out the door. I look better. I feel better and all that good stuff. So, I think, Sorry. Go ahead. One of the differences is between a product and a service company is with a, with a service company, it's more people-based mm -hmm. because you're dealing with face-to-face -face with people. So that means if you have employees, you have the challenge of 
maintaining your service level with the people that mm -hmm. you have. Mm -hmm. And that sure. comes from training. Of course, the banks yep. are really good at that. But if you're a small business, you know, you don't necessarily have the resources of the you know, Bank of Hawaii. So the challenge is to be able to maintain that level of service that you know sustains your business and that customers want to get mm -hmm. um, without much money to be able to do that. That's, that's the yeah, challenge. Scalability that's becomes a bit more problematic, mm -hmm. I think, in a service-based business. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because you, if you're going to scale, if, if you are it, and you are really good at it, how do I, how do I, because I can only do so many classes at and the, a time. Right, so part of the reason why you're good at it is because the passion that you that have, correct. the right. vision that, that you have, and how do you then inject that or expect to others. that? Yeah. <laughs> so you've got to replicate that. Right. So how do you create standard operating procedures and so forth? What is it that your ideal client digs? Mm -hmm. What is it that makes them buy, whether it's going to be you or somebody else? So you're going to end up finding people that you can, I don't want to say clone, but have very similar um, values and so forth. So this is really some of the core competencies that that individual business owner will probably need to have. Can I find the right people that have that share the same values, that can execute the same way that I do? That is a huge core competence. It's not about putting bodies in there. Mm -hmm. It's putting the right bodies and that are you good at identifying those bodies? Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a question. How are, we gonna, how are we going to use blended capital, this is a long one, <laughs> uh, patient capital, social entrepreneurship, and the newer cooperative uh, funding models to help our struggling local people have access to opportunities and economic patience to be entrepreneurs? I feel like I should say it again. One, yeah. more, time. <laughs> one more time, please. How are we going to use blended capital, patient capital, social entrepreneurship, and the newer cooperative funding models um, that's a mouthful. Yeah, I, I, th I think it really is kind of um, a comprehensive question to what we're all talking about, as mm -hmm. far as the different, uh, you know, the 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 boots on the ground that we're talking about, the psychological aspects, the very uh, the understanding the environment, and the landscape you're in, understanding what's changing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of my guess as to where they're going in general. Right. Well, they bring up social entrepreneurship too, so yeah. that's kind of a buzzword. Right now, can you with, explain that uh, one to me? <laughs> sure. Well, it's it's having it's building a business, starting a business that also gives back. Mm. That actually, that's very that is getting very popular. I'm mm -hmm. hearing about that more and more. With um, they want that, and, and the businesses that that people invest in. Right. So they want to make sure it has that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So it seems like uh, that's an, that's where. Your, um, the crowdfunding, crowdfunding or the GoFundMe, really yes. that's it's it seems like those social so those social enterprises are able to raise money with the online uh, platforms because it resonates with the people giving the money. If they're depending on what their business is, uh, if it's a product or a service, as long as they're giving back to a, cer a certain percentage back to a nonprofit or a certain segment that that needs help or that that touches them, then they'll they'll give the money to help fund the business. Okay, question from Liberty about uh, bootstrapping. I'm not mm. familiar with that. Um, and how does that work for new business owners? She wants to ask you. She says, okay. for you. Bootstrapping. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. So one of our counselors, Noella Napoleon, she talks about bootstrapping all the time. So bootstrapping is when you are committed to work hard and put yourself all in, and you're looking for sources of funding, usually from family, I think. Okay. That's what I Is consider that what bootstrapping. bootstrapping means? I, okay. That's my interpretation. I don't know. I'm looking at Joe wondering if he has a different interpretation. Well, no, I think that's part of it, but yeah. I think it's also not only on the finance part, mm -hmm. but everything else. Like maybe you're like Holly and you start in your kitchen. <laughs> that's bootstrapping because you don't have a commercial kitchen or a, another place to, to make your product, right? Bubble Shack was started over a kitchen sink, yeah. and um, that's bootstrapping. Mm -hmm. So, beside the financing, it's the operations, you know, delivering the product yourself, mm -hmm. being the salesperson. I think doing all those things are, are bootstrapping. It's when right. you can't afford to have somebody else do it, or to pay for something, you just do it yourself. Mm -hmm. To me, that's bootstrapping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds right. It's it's kind of an old-fashioned term. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, we got bootstrapping it. out of the way. <laughs> okay, one question we want to get to is mentorship. Um, how important that has been uh, to you and how important you feel it is to, to find that mentor and what a mentor can do for you to help um, um, in you and your success as a... Well, I had a, a business years ago and I did have 
a mentor and I was lucky enough to have someone in the same area that I was in for, for, for guidance. And I thought it was really uh, important not only for the technical knowledge, mm. but also for some of the more, how shall I say, uh, spiritual type things where it's easy to get it's discouraged important. when things yeah. are not going well and to have some perspective about life because business is not everything, even though a lot of times it seems like it is. There's other aspects of your life that are affected, your family is affected. So I found it really, really helpful to have someone that had gone through a lot of things beforehand was able to uh, teach those things to me. Mm -hmm. And that I find now it's really interesting, I'm kind of in that position with some of our clients where we're guiding them through some of these kinds of things. So mm -hmm. to me it was really, really important. And if you're fortunate enough to find someone like that, you know, don't let it uh, go by so easily. Yeah. And making friends with other entrepreneurs is is pretty key because when you're, you know, at the end of the day, and, and you know, you feel like you want to unload. It's it's really hard to unload on your friends that have no idea right. what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, glazed eye. Well, yeah. It's it's Try not to. yeah. It's it's great to just have those those friends that are that are doing the same thing that you're doing. So it's it's been nice having those over the years. Mm -hmm. That's great. So for for our center, mentorship is extremely <clears throat> important. We have uh, one of our taglines is women helping women succeed. And so a lot of the uh, a lot of the women that come for counseling, but also uh, where small business is concerned, but we also have a leadership component as well. And so we have a lot of women who volunteer, a lot of women, uh, business women in the community who volunteer their time to come and facilitate at our center, at workshops and programs that we have. And so uh, it, it really resonates with us with women lifting other women yeah. and being there for them and and uh, kind of guiding them, giving them, showing them the path or what, like like um, Joe said, you know, what their experiences have been in learning from that. Rem mm -hmm. Reminds me a lot when we talk about in healthcare about burnout, trying to avoid burnout mm -hmm. and really right. that, that network and support system is Definitely. huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another aspect yeah. of that is in our center we often have interns from UH or, or mm. HP or different schools. Um, and I think that providing those students with that kind of opportunity uh, is something that they can use for their future because not only do they get to put something on their resume that they actually did something, we throw a lot at them and say, okay, here's a project, here's something you can do. If you've got a problem, let me know. And I think that's really valuable for them. So mentorship is also a, a part of what we do on that level. You so beautifully led to my the last question I wanted to get to here from <laughs> Teresa on the Big Island. She said, what skill sets can educators, and really I think probably other mentors and people within the community, can provide to students and young people in school or at that younger age to help develop young entrepreneurs for future small business owners? When we're starting early there, mm -hmm. what kind of things can we in, in, can inject in their life? What kind of support thing can we give them to help guide them? Well. My tendency is to go toward the financial area, and I think it's not really too early to start with financial education, financial literacy, mm -hmm. because it's really it's surprising yeah. how many people yeah. are not financially literate. Yep. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the person that used to work in my position, I asked her, you know, why did she want to work and help people? And she said that uh, she had gotten a little bit of money from her parents uh, when they passed away and she was young. She had no idea what to do with it or how to manage it, so she wanted, after she learned it, she wanted to help other people. And I thought that was really terrific, very ins inspirational. So I would say uh, for the educators, maybe that's one area to look at. And there are, there are programs around that will do that. And it's amazing what the, what the, what the students can do. Yeah. yeah. I, think they, I think students are much more resilient than we give them credit for. Mm -hmm. um, they're like sponges. I, I do junior achievement. <coughs> at the schools, usually in the fourth, fifth grade segment and so forth, and how, how it, it tremendously engaged that they are. And, uh, and I would tell you, as an instructor, I actually am learning when I'm delivering content at the That's same time. That's a really time. good point. It's great for the mentors and for Absolutely. the adults mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in their growth. It helps you to, if you will, kind of go back to your roots and kind of go, geez, you know, I totally forgot about that. And I've been so caught up in the other things that I forgot really some of the basic fundamentals that made America great, 
I mean, mm -hmm. us, uh, yeah, our community is great and so forth, and helped us to achieve whatever it is that uh, we've um, accomplished over the years. Mm -hmm. Right. Going back to these fundamentals, I think we need to teach our kids this. Mm -hmm. There's some uh, some interesting programs in some of the private schools here. Um, I can't remember exactly which one, but I did have a group of students that came to Bubble Shack when I owned that company, mm -hmm. and they had set up a program where they taught them how to create a product, at, which happened to be soap, and so they learned how to make soap, and then they set them up in an environment where they could actually go sell it, and then they, they went and sold the soaps, and then they made money, and they taught them the whole yep. business process, and they were only like third and fourth graders. Mm. So I, was, I thought that was amazing. I mean, such a great program. And then um, that did a lot for you too, right? Yeah, yeah. Was yeah. awesome. And I'm, is kind of going I'm going to have to make history. a quick short on that story. Sure. We've got about 10 seconds left. But real oh. quick <laughs> is that when I was in junior high school, or high, uh, junior high school, there was a junior achievement program about building a product, a little company, and we're selling it Neat. to make money for us. Exciting, exciting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, all of you, uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, thanking of all of our guests. Joseph Burns, Oahu Director of the Hawaii Small Business Development Center. Holly Harding, owner of the uh, business called O'o Hawaii. Donovan Koki, a Senior Vice President at Bank of Hawaii, and Colleen McElhinney, Program Director of the Patsy Mink Center for Business and Leadership. Thank you again so much, all of you. That was a great discussion. Thank you. All right, next week on Insights, post-traumatic stress disorder, most commonly known as PTSD, affects military veterans more than anyone else. What are the signs and what are veterans getting, uh, are they getting the treatment that they need? Join the discussion next week. I'm Laurie Amata for Insights on PBS Hawaii, Ahui Ho.